doesn't get old, does it? He has a refocus of uh, Christ's kingdom come. And that's where we're going to end up today is talking about the kingdom of God. The uh, name of this sermon is just an independent. I, I am woken up usually early in the morning by the Lord. It maybe starts with the anxiety I have about how are we going to pay this bill? How are we going to get this kid to college? What about health? What about what if, what if, what if? And uh, in that process, the Lord gave me several verses the past three weeks. And so I just want to share with you my early morning iterations and my study. And I think it's going to bless you. And so here's the first question I would ask you. We're going to finish up on the Lord's Prayer today. I got four specific verses for you. You have your Bibles, turn to them, uh, your phone, whatever, iPad. I mean, use, use whatever you want to. Here's the first question. How effective are we in our prayer lives? How, how effective are we? I mean, uh, we want to be effective, right? Like, you don't, you don't want to do something and it not have the effect you desire it to have. You don't want to go to the gym and sweat and not get the return. You don't want to work on your business. You don't want to work on your marriage. You don't want to. Uh, I remember teaching my girls how to throw a ball when they were little. We would literally, we were at the pool, we'd throw it back and forth. And as they got older, it was one of the funnest games. We still do that. Within, everywhere we've traveled in the world, somebody will get a ball, and we'll just throw it back and forth and uh, teaching them to do the littlest things. I want to be effective in what I do. How effective are your prayers right now? So better yet, how do you put metrics on your prayer life? That's really the, the question because some ideology is taught in church today. If you do this, then God does that. And if you pray this way, then God responds this way. And I'll just tell you right up front, we're going to talk about petitions today, listing our requests to the Lord. The Lord doesn't need you to list any more things you need or want to him ever because he already knows them. Okay, the petitions that Jesus gives us in the Lord's Prayer are for us. It's not for the Trinity. Trinity is not waiting for you to give them the list this afternoon. Oh, yeah, thanks for letting us know. We didn't know you wanted or needed that. God knows. But as for us as children, children need to verbalize things. Amen, parents? They need to tell you if something happened. Okay? They need to tell you if something hurts or if there's some issues at school so the parent can come in uh, and move. Now, the difference of God and his children, difference of God and you and me, is that he knows our needs before we have the need. And he knows our wants before he, he, we even realize something we want. So is, is this kind of how you put metrics to your prayers? More answered prayers, higher value, less answered, something's wrong. Lord, I prayed for this. And if you give it to me, then obviously we're in communication but if I pray for this and you don't give it to me, maybe I didn't say it loud enough. Maybe I need to use a Koine Greek. Maybe I need to fast. Maybe I need to do all these things. I'm just here to tell you today. The primary purpose of prayer is adoring a holy God. That's the primary purpose. If we get that down, a lot of the little anxieties and issues and worries we have will go right out the door. I promise you. A lot of our issues are tied up in good things that we've made great things. I'm going to show you how we're going to reverse that today. Let's pray. Um, this Bible study is for believers. Okay? So if you call yourself a Christian, I'm going to irritate you today. And if you don't like it, you can take it up with the Lord after lunch or whatever. Okay? Um, so let's grow a little bit. Let's read Scripture if we're believers, what we're called to do is come under the authority of God through his word and do what it says we're called to do. If you're just an observer of God, then you can continue to work out a compromise deal. By the way, how's that going for you, right, really? It doesn't, it doesn't work, okay? So is God interested in your needs and wants? He actually is. He just already knows them. That's, that shouldn't be the top of our list. But how we pray predominantly is, um, Lord, I want to be about your kingdom. But let me give you the 15 things I need you to do for me. Because these are the greater things. And God, and I'll show you in scripture, is saying to us, they're not the greater things. 
I'm the greater thing. I'm the great. I should be number one. And I'll add all these things to you. Let's pray. We'll start in Matthew 7, 7. You can go to there quickly and let's, let's get into the word. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, and speak to us as only you can. You have all power. You have all majesty. You have all holiness. You are merciful. You are forgiving. You are loving. You are also jealous. You are wrathful. You are angry. You are righteous. And you know everywhere we've been and everything we've done. And you know the grievous sins that we will do to offend you next year and the year following. Yet you are also incredibly sovereign. And you sent your son to live a life among us. It's basically just a blue collar dude. Three and a half year ministry. Gave his life. Perfect salvation. Grace is given. Forgiveness is extended. We are given new lives. We have not been given new lives, Lord, to satisfy our own souls. We have been given new lives to worship you and adore you and put you first. And then all these things will be added to us. Open our eyes that we might see. In your name we pray. Amen. I did this whole elaborate... um, draw thing that I was going to do today. And this morning, you know, technology said, nope. So I'm just going to teach it. Uh, Maybe I'll make it available online. Matthew 7, 7. This is Jesus talking. So it's not a secondary, it's a primary. It's it's, It's the son of God, fully God, the creator speaking to us. And uh, here's how this started in my own life. All these things pile up, right? When you're, you're, when, you're, when, when I was single before Selena, li- life was a little bit more frivolous, zippity doo da. wake up on Saturday and have nothing to do. I haven't felt that way in 20 years. I always have something I must do on Saturday morning. Uh, and then you get married, uh, and I had my wonderful wife, and she's strong, and she's amazing, but I feel responsible. I'm pastor, provider, protector in our home, so that's a, a layer of responsibility. And then we started having babies Girl babies, I have three girls, they're amazing. We have two dogs, even they're female. Like everybody is female in my house, but me, I am holding it down. And so responsibilities like this, and what if, what ifs grow with the people and connections we have, and that's normal. What's abnormal is when we take our focus off the one who has called us, saved us, sealed us, and made us his. And we begin looking at the details instead of the creator. So uh, one night, and I memorized this first years ago, probably a little kid, King James. I'm like, Lord, what am I called to do? What am I called to do? Um, Jesus' words, Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. So here's what I'll say before I explain that verse. I want your prayers to be maximized. Okay, that sounds so Tony Robbins, but I do. I want your prayers to be maximized. And how you maximize your prayers is you pray how God has called you to pray, not the way you think God wants to hear. Okay, that's a miscommunication and it will always be off. Okay, so when when the Bible says ask and it will be given to you, you can pray for a specific thing that's under petitions. What I would encourage you to think about praying for regularly, daily, maybe hourly, is godly wisdom. In my marriage, Lord, I'm asking for godly wisdom. In my raising of my children, my precious kids, I'm asking for godly wisdom. In the little bit of finances you've given me, I'm asking for godly wisdom. In my physiological health, my emotional well-being, godly wisdom is what I'm asking, Lord. I'm asking you to tell me what is your design for me. I'm not going to tell you what I've decided for me. That second prayer doesn't go well. But the first one is honoring your creator. And I'm telling you, it's the biggest return for your prayer. Ask. We want to maximize the effectiveness of our prayer. Godly wisdom. Now, the second one is what threw me off a little bit. Seek. This means to go after, to explore, to see, right? To look for something. Um, how many of y'all remembered, um, what were they called? 
key maps. Do you remember those? Anybody over 35, 40? Raise your hand if you remember them. Come on, let's just go through that PTSD together. Okay. Um, now, listen, you, you generation, y'all have GPS, which is also a gift from the Lord. I love GPS in my car. I use it when I go half a mile away. Okay, that's just me. Keynote maps where you're driving already at an accelerated speed, which if you're not watching where you go, you can die. You had this plastic map that you had to turn and go to the section of the city you were in and then find the street or the highway you're on looking for the exit you had to take. That's what we did, okay? Um, that was seeking, all right? So the seek part, I'm like, okay, does it, are, are you talking about, Lord, I need to be looking in the right places? Or these are all the things I want, Lord. So do I need to be seeking them to see? So here's the next passage the Lord gave me. Now, it's, uh, I'm linear. So Matthew 7, 7, if you just back up in the previous chapter, Matthew 6, 33, here's what the Lord says. And he tells us what we are to seek. So just like if we're asking for something, godly wisdom is something that the Lord will pour on you. Okay, you'll get a return on that prayer. The seeking is also, if you're seeking things that are not of his will, it's, it's tiny ROI, okay? So here's Jesus himself has just told the people, listen, um, I, know about, I know about your needs and wants. I know what you need to eat, what you need to drink and clothes, and you can add all the things in there. The house you need to buy and the education you're trying to obtain for your children and the health and all those things. I know about all that. Since I know about all that, what I want you to seek is this, Matthew 6, 33. Christian, this should go right to your heart. But seek first, first, primary, number one, above everything, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That does not mean when you were justified and saved, that well, I sought the Lord. No, he actually in that moment sought you. This is a re-seeking and coming back to the Lord and really meditating, kind of um, savoring, spending time with understanding the kingdom of God, according to conjunction, and his righteousness. And the last part of that, Jesus says this, and all these things will be provided for you. Jesus doesn't need your list or petitions. He knows your list. What he's asking for and honestly demanding is your worship. He's the only being that can command us to worship him and it not be a sin. You command worship, it's a sin. Influencers that you follow command worship, it's a sin. Our legal, governmental, whatever. It's a sin to worship anybody apart from the creator. He's the only one can, can say, worship me, and it'd be a good thing. Seek first the kingdom of God. So seek first the good things of life. Now here's what I had done. And as I'm reading this passage, I had realized that I was like, okay, seek first the kingdom of God, and then all these things will be added to you. So you have these seek the kingdom and God's righteousness, and you have all the things. And all the things are not bad things. They're actually good things. Your family is a good thing. Your health is a good thing. Where you live is a good thing. Okay, the education you aspire to is a good thing. The nonprofit you work in is a good thing. Probably the gym you go to is a good thing. Where you drink coffee is a good thing. It's a good thing. It is not the greater thing. And what I had done, guilty, is I had lifted up my family my health, where we live, education, all those things, from being good a thing to being a greater thing. And the Lord really convicted my heart in this passage. He's like, hey, um, your greater things have actually become an idol to you. This is where you spend all your time. And if your response was kind of mine in the moment, like, no, 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 Lord, like I really, I desire, you're, you're my most important thing. Well, then let's just listen to our prayer lives this past week. What did you spend time in doing? Did you spend time on hitting the list? Which God knows. And he provides for you in the Lord's prayer. We'll get to that in just a minute. But did you spend time on the greater thing? Or did you spend most of your time on the good things? You see how that's out of order. Like you and I, if we're going to be mature Christians, if we're going to lead our families, if we're going to lead others, 
If you're going to have something of reality to share with the people in your life that are looking for Jesus, you must spend more time on seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, um, one book I would recommend, I didn't put it in these notes. You can hit me up, Pastor Tom at missionchurchsa.org. You want to, um, Randy Alcorn, the book Heaven. Just buy it today. You're a Kindle person, I'm a Kindle person. Just buy it, you'll have it forever. If you like hardbacks, this book is big enough to hurt somebody, okay? There's a lot of pages. If you throw it at somebody they're not looking, it could be dangerous, okay? But Randy Alcorn is a guy that wrote this book on heaven. I'm a, I burn through books. I can read a lot of volume. In this book, when I read it, I would read a few pages, and I would have to put it down, and I would tear up a little bit, and I would think, wait a minute. Is that what the kingdom of God is about? Like, wait a minute. Are we going to see these things? Wait a minute. Like, let's, let's ponder for a second what it means to have no more emotional pain. Let's ponder what it means, some of us, to have no more physical pain. Let's ponder what it would be like as a believer to not have those deep scars of abuse affect you anymore. Let's talk about soldiers not having PTSD from things you've seen or done. Let's talk about just having a pure heart and peace that passes all understanding. This is seeking the kingdom of God. This is beginning to chew on that which is all around us invisibly, but that one day, and I thought about last year when my father died, in that moment from him going to this feeble, broken person just eaten up with Alzheimer's to this space where there was no more physical pain and he was completely cognizant and he heard the voice of the Savior and he entered into a space where he is in right now experiencing nothing but joy and peace that passes all understanding. We must ponder these things. Because when we do, we're not only obeying the Lord, but we're filling our hearts and minds up with things that eradicate anxiety and selfishness. The list is about you. And again, the list is not made of bad things. It's made of good things. But good things can become an idol just like evil things can become an idol. Thinking about eternity. Uh, I would encourage, if you're a reader, if you're not, you should still read it. Randy Alcorn to Heaven. Just read it. I don't read how-to books. I don't like them. People ask me all the time, Pastor Tom, have you read the latest book? Blah, blah, blah. No, I haven't. What are you reading? Godfather series in the Bible. That's what I read. Okay? Um, I, I like, that's what I like to read. I like reality stuff. All right? Sometimes it's more reality than some of the how-to books. This isn't a how-to book. It's just him just exhaustively going to the Bible and giving you all the passages on the kingdom of God and heaven, and what's next, and what's to come, and it, and it draws your heart to focus on eternity instead of your, your, your little situation you're in right now, which will not matter 100 years from now, okay? Um, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things will be added in God's perfect wisdom. Um, some of the things you want are not good for you, amen? Me? I've been praying for a Toyota 4Runner still have a 2007 Honda Accord, okay? All right, and I love it. Um, some of the things that, you know, if our kids, if we were to bring all the kids in here right now and say, listen, this week, y'all can eat and do whatever you want to do. It would be anarchy in our houses. And there would be no nutritional value from here until when we stop that madness, all right? So Jesus is saying, focus on what is present all around you that you cannot see and focus on what you will see one day and focus on new heaven and new earth and focus on my righteousness that comes from Jesus and focus on the forgiveness and the mercy that is given you. Focus on these things and the things that you need and want. I'll take care of that. I know what they are better than you do. So here's two processes. Flawed process. I seek my greater things. Then I recognize God's good things. This is wrong. This is American church right now. It's taking other continents by storm too. I'm going to focus on the good things, my family and stuff. It's the greater things. And God, you're a good thing. Listen, way to go, God. Thanks for saving me for all this stuff. Or the godly process. I seek the best things. God's kingdom and his righteousness. 
then God adds to our lives the good things that he chooses. All right? Um, now, this was giving me, like, a lot of anxiety. I wanted to do it right. I was so focused on what I thought were the best things, wasting a lot of spiritual and emotional energy that affected me physically. Like, some of us are praying for things that we really shouldn't be praying for, and you find yourself getting irritated with the one who created you because his answer, and it is an answer, is no. And you, like, keep on, like, well, the Bible says just keep on knocking. I just need to keep on knocking. Not with the wrong request. You don't. You really don't. And somebody came up to me, one of our EMTs, after the early service. We're talking about this principle. He said, the crazy thing about that is when I am, and this is an ex-drug addict, ex, like, been in a lot of places. He said, the more I focus on the Lord and who he is and the beauty of his salvation and the beauty of the gospel, my list goes down. Right? It goes down. This works in relationships, too, when you're irritated at your spouse. And I'm sure we're the only ones that most of y'all married, you have it all figured out, and there's never any issue. But when you have issues and irritations with somebody you love and you choose to focus on God's glory and his righteousness, even that list of irritations will go down. I promise you, just that's the beauty of how it works. So I went over to Paul's passage in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. I memorized, my kids memorized this to a song when they were little kids. Um, Here's what Paul says. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. Through prayer, petition, thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Now, those of us that have been Christian longer than a minute, how hard is this? You know, your churchy mind kicks in and goes like, oh, yeah, that's really good. And then the reality of it kicks in like, this is freaking hard. I I can zip back to my anxiety so fast. And I'm not even an anxious person. But internally, wheels are just rolling. Well, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? Don't be anxious. Easier said than done. Uh, Let's study this passage a bit more. It'll take us right back to Matthew 6. Don't be anxious. Do what instead? So three things right here to combat anxiety, right? Uh, it's not, look, I'm not anti-medication, but it's not more medication. It's definitely not more Netflix. It's not more sex. It's not more food. It's not more drink. It's not more working out. It's not more money in your 401k. Those things will just empty you, make you a shell. Here's what they are. The first one is pray. Prayer. Now, we're going to break down prayer in just a minute because there's two parts that I want you to see. But it's learning to pray. Like, how often are you praying right now? Like, any of y'all just pray randomly, like you're praying out loud in your car? I mean, thank goodness we have Bluetooth headset, now I can cover it up. Like, years ago, I would pray, and Lord, I just, people would pull up, and I'm like, Lord, I just really just want to pray, and because I looked like I was crazy. But who cares what people think? Like, we need to talk about what we're doing. We need to learn how to glorify God and think about his presence in moments, so we pray. Second one is this, petition. Prayer and petition. Well, what the, what's the petition? Okay, we're going to see it in the Lord's Prayer in a minute. It's you bringing your list. And let me just tell you again. The list, you're given an opportunity to bring your things to God for you, not for the Lord. He already knows your list. He already knows your list. You're not bringing it to his attention. And I think we all do this. Lord, remember, I asked for this. Probably didn't hear me the first time, but I just wanted to say it again. And the last one is this, be thankful. Be thankful. Be the most thankful person in your family. Men, you're called to lead. Are you the most thankful person in your family? Uh, Be the most thankful in any relationship. My mother is the most thankful person on the planet. She's watching right now. She's probably thanking me for saying this right now. She will outthink me. She's got a black belt. She's much quicker than I am. We went to see her last weekend. It's like, Mom, just thanks for having us this weekend. Oh, honey, thank you for being here. Did you just outthink me? Well, Mom, we're going to go get you some groceries. We just want to take care of you for all that you've done for us. Oh, honey, thanks for doing that. You guys are so loving, and I just so appreciate who you are. Did you just outthink me again? Like, listen, be like my mom. Like, just people send you a thank you card. Send them a thank you card for sending you a thank you card. Okay? Overwhelm people with your thankfulness that they would look upon you and say, 
Callie, does anything phase her or him? Like, they're just so thankful. Thankfulness in this passage right here means that we pray and we petition the Lord with our needs and whatever he decides, we say, your will be done, Lord. Jesus, Garden of Gethsemane, hey, if there's any way this cup can pass for me, but not my will, but your will be done. This is where we show our immaturity so many times that we ask the Lord for something and he doesn't give it to us and we're like, and we pout and we walk away like a two-year-old. Not my will, but your will be done. Lord, you know the beginning from the end. You are the alpha and the omega. You know exactly what's happening right now. I can only see today, so I say thank you. And I know in some circumstances, that is super stinking hard. I get it. I know, I know, I know. But this is what the Bible says. So, looked at that passage. Okay, um, I want to pray. I want to petition to petition. It's throwing me off a little bit. So if you go right back to Matthew, we just go further back in the chapter, the Lord's Prayer. This is Jesus, who is fully God and fully man in this moment, is telling us how to pray literally to him and the Father. Yet when he's on earth, he's fully vested in his, in his human element, and he's joining us. The first thing he says is our Father. He doesn't say my Father. He says our Father because he was the son and we are the adopted kids. And when you are adopted into a family, you were adopted the first day and you were just one of the kids the next day. Adoption is your past tense. Child of God is your present tense. My sister is adopted. I don't think I've ever called her adopted unless I explain the beauty of theology of adoption. She's been my sister since she was three days old and I met her for the first time. God looks upon you and me not as adopted children. He looks upon us as his children. And this is who we are. So Jesus, our older brother, our savior, our redeemer, is showing us how to pray. Here's what he says. This then is how you should pray. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Some of us learn and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I like that better. Debt sounds like, you know, a bill you got from AT&T. Trespassing, that's different in Texas, amen? Okay. <laughs> and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Yes, Lord. Here he ends it. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Three parts of this prayer, two-part adoration, one-part petition. It's teaching us how to pray. Jesus himself begins with adoration of his Father. All right, keep the verse up on the screen. I want everybody to see that so you can, um, do we get the whole 9 to 13 up there? Okay, we'll just walk through it. First part is this. First part, prayer of adoration. Our Father... Holy is your name, your kingdom forever, your will be done in heaven and on earth. Adoration. Your will is done on heaven and earth, Lord. I'm not going to change you through my prayer. So the, the primary focus and purpose of me praying is to adore you, which is worship. And American church is missing this by a, a, a mile right now. Singing is great. It can be worship. It can also be self-adoration. Look how good I sing and look how good the band is. And you want all those things. But if singing is not leading us to adoring God in all his glory, then it is not worship. Jesus is worshiping his heavenly father. Our father, holy is your name. You are perfect. You are righteous. There's no blemish in you. There's no mistake in you. There's no sin in you. That's how you've always been. That's how you are today. That's how you will be tomorrow. Wow, this is my adopted father. This is my dad. He is perfect and he has saved me. That is focusing on the kingdom of God and the king of this universe and of this world. Your kingdom forever. 
Uh, some, some cults like the Mormon church, and I'm sorry if you come from that, it is a cult, are like Jesus and God, rah, they're fighting back and forth with Satan, and they're even, and they're both created. That's garbage, it's heresy. Jesus is the creator. Satan is the created, okay? It is God's kingdom forever. There is no doubt in that. There is no, we don't know what's going to happen next. That's, that's, that's garbage. We do know Christ is kingdom forever. As a Christian, you can say, I am a part of the kingdom that is forever. I may have cancer right now, and I, and I may be stage four. That is my, my mama. Yeah, she, she, the Lord may call her home. God's kingdom is still forever. And if we're tied into our moments, we will miss the beauty of and the love and the joy of saying, no matter what is happening right now, I am tied into a forever kingdom. And whatever happens now will not last. And there will come a day when tears are dried. And knees are not sore anymore. And emotional, deep, abusive pain is eliminated. Because God's kingdom is forever. I can feel you focusing on that right now. Do you sense a difference there? You're, you're, you're listening and you're focusing and you're hearing these words and it takes you out of the mire, Psalm 41, of a dark pit. It removes you from that pit and it, it elevates you. And that is what worship should do. This is what Jesus is showing us how to do. Second part of Prayer is a prayer of petition. Again, it's a gift that God gives us because he's just that awesome. He knows exactly what you need and what you want, but he allows you as a heavenly father to talk to him about the details he already knows. And you sharing those petitions is not going to change him in any way. You sharing that gets it off your, your mind and your heart. It relieves some pressure. And so the third part in the prayer petition, our daily needs, forgive us our sins. Jesus wisely teaches us how to pray, not only forgive us our sins, but teach us to forgive people that have trespassed against us, right? Keep us away from temptation. Yeah, temptation is ugly. I hate temptation. I hate it in your life. I hate it in my life because it leads you somewhere and delivers from evil. Our world is stinking full of evil right now. Governmental level, school board level, neighborhood level. What level is evil not present today? Okay. What level is God not present today? He's present also. He's doing a work. Deliver us from evil. Now the third part of the prayer is back to adoration. For your kingdom come. For your will be done. Your power. Your glory. So if you look at the Lord's prayer... And listen to me carefully say this, okay? The petition could be pulled out and still be a beautiful, righteous, God-honoring prayer. The petition is for you and me. But the adoration is the worship piece that sets up and reframes the petition. The prayer could be this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. And yours is the glory forever and ever. Amen. That is a beautiful prayer. It's a beautiful prayer. Because this adoring God is, is seeking first his kingdom. Is thinking about the beautiful, beautiful thing that he did for wrecks like you and me sending his son to live among us, saving us when we shouldn't have been saved, forgiving us when we shouldn't have been forgiven. Church, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Spend your week here. And he'll add those things to you. For those of you that are single, marriage is not the ultimate platform. For those of you who don't have kids, having kids is not the ultimate platform. For those of you that are working on your first college graduate in your family ever, that's not the ultimate platform. Those are, those are the good things. Good things. They're good things. Good things. They're not the greater things. Put them back in their place. And seek first the kingdom of God. And as we seek it, let me just tell you, 
it just, it's like an overflow. You can't keep it in, all right? Some of y'all have those family members that can't keep anything in, amen? Maybe if you're wondering who it is, it's probably you, okay? They just, they get bubbled up and they got to talk about the, the presidents and everything and, and all the time. Um, man, how about we have that in a good way that we are so full of just studying the Bible in terms of what's, what it says about kingdom and forever and, and what's, what's going on next when God calls his saints home and what is salvation, the beauty of it. And Lord, I want more. Lord, teach me more. That is another prayer that you can pray right now that God will answer. Lord, enrapture my heart and my mind with your kingdom. Lord, enrapture my heart and mind with the beauty of your gospel. Lord, take me and just wash me with your presence. Forgive me for focusing on good things. I've made them an idol. Refocus me on the greater things. This is what leads your families. This is what makes your coworkers go, okay, there's something different about her. Something different about him. Uh, it's not like all the cool things you do. It is the perfect God you serve. It is your love for him. And this is like a, you can't stop talking about the goodness and glory of God. Not sin of others, but the glory of the God who is perfect and holy and loves you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Amen. Gosh, I love Bible study. Um, communion team, come on down. We have a baptism. It's happening right after communion. Excited about that. Just to, to remind you guys, baptism does not save you, but it is an obedience factor. The baptism that does save is the baptism of fire when you are saved. In that justification moment, Jesus pours out on you his irresistible grace. Your eyes are open. You're never the same. You accept the gift that has been given you. And what water baptism is, is um, sh us showing the world around us what team we're on now. Okay? So if you haven't been baptized before, uh, a lot of times I see people in church not baptized because they want to control the medium. Maybe they got saved five, 10 years ago and it's just not right yet. That's garbage. Obey. Obey. Okay, you don't need to be baptized for the fifth time, fifth time either. If you're a Christ follower and you've been baptized and you've done what God has called you to do, we'll have one baptism after this. If you want to be baptized, you can come down and talk to Pastor Daniel. He's here somewhere. He's in the back in the, in the sweet floral shirt there. He'll be down front. Come talk to him and let's celebrate with you. Okay, if you're not a believer, uh, communion is not for you. Nobody's going to be looking at you. When, judge you, that's between you and the Lord. But if you're not a believer, don't just come down because it's protocol or it's where you come from. Don't do that. Obey the Lord. It's for believers only. If you need a minute or two to pray and just ask the Lord to convict your heart. Conviction is good. Confession is good. Repentance is good. All a part of worship. All right? It's not showing how bad you are. Remember, God knows everything about you. It's a, it's a heart that's turning to the Lord and saying, I need help. I need you. I need your presence. I need more of your kingdom. When you're ready, church, come forward. Amen and amen.